Hello, triangle enjoyers and rectangle enjoyers and triangle inside the rectangle enjoyers. Uh, today, I've got my review of the Chinese version of the Vertex Angle TKL, which, uh, yes, please, everybody, keep sending me black review boards. It's fantastic. I love it. So anyway, the Vertex, sorry, the angle by Vertex is a TKL, standard format TKL, that's F12, that's uh, available both in WinKey, WinKeyless, ISO, and ANSI, which apparently is an important thing to note now because a lot of boards have stopped supporting ISO for some obscure reason. Uh, it is gasket mounted, and they claim, uh, they claim that there is a leaf spring mechanism, which we'll be putting to the test. Uh, it's got a buttload of flex cuts on the PCB, as well as a daughter board. And it comes in a few totally not made up colors, including Crow, uh, Lunar, Chainmail, Bianco, and Fog. And the highlight of the board, uh, which you can see on its top, is the triangular moonstone, which is a sodium potassium aluminum silicate of the feldspar group. I don't even know what that means, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, the board, this particular board, weighs around 2,800 grams built with absolutely no foam in it, including, uh, like, not including the required foam, which I do not have installed. And the Chinese version was approximately 441 US dollars. So let's pop in. We'll take a look at it. This is going to be a relatively confusing review as I've shot this over like five different, complete different, like five completely different weeks. So uh, good luck, guys. See you there. Alrighty. Let us start with the unboxing experience. Now, longtime viewers of mine uh, might know how I feel about the unboxing experience. But to be fair, to be fair, the unboxing experience was quite nice for the angle. So it comes in this sleeve, okay? And inside this sleeve is this box. All right, just pretend I slid it out of there, okay? So this kind of just, let's get a little bit of a zoom out action. This just slides over it, and then you can just see the uh, the angle logo. It's quite cool. This looks very expensive. I wish I had a hard case instead, obviously. But there is some useful information on the box, which is nice to see. So this is a wing keyless, A plate, A for awesome, in crow, which is black, my favorite color. And yeah, designed by Tao, produced by Vertex in association with AKS made by Han Tu, made in China. Cool. So this box has been sitting on my floor for a while, so it'll be kind of dirty and fingerprinty because people keep sending me black things. So inside this box, or inside the sleeve, is the box. And the box is one of those dual, like, dual layers with the little, uh, little slot in the middle, kind of like the Zephyr, if you've ever seen a Zephyr box. But the quality of the box is nice. There's a triangle here, some text here. We don't really care about that. And it just opens up. Nice. All right. Again, this has been sitting on my floor for like over a month. So uh, lovely. There, There's a box here that says tools on it. I've obviously emptied this box, but I have kept all of the things that were in there. So in there was actually a lot of useful stuff. Like I'm actually surprised. So there were the gaskets. These are not actual uh, like uh, rubber gaskets. These are foam gaskets. We'll go over these when we talk about the internals. All of these are just gaskets, gaskets, gaskets. And there's two extra feet in here, which, okay, that's good. All right, so feet are obviously supposed to be in this bag. Stabilizer shims. Uh, so this is a 1.2 millimeter PCB in here, and it does come with branded shims. If you look uh, quite closely, you can actually see that they are branded, which is pretty cool. I do like the organization, and I do like the Ziploc bags. There's eh, the daughter board screws, of which there are no extras. I just happen to screw in only two. Case screws. They do give you additional brand new case screws, which is nice because you might actually need them. 
daughter board cap weight screws. These are actually all extras, by the way. Fantastic to see. And most importantly, right here, hexagon wrench in M2 and M2.5. This is actually fantastic because this keyboard uses two different types of hardware. Realistically, for the case, you only need the uh, M2.5, but the M2 is required if you want to get the daughter board out. This I love. Uh, I love giving this, like, I love the fact that people who don't have this specific hardware will just be able to build it right out of the box. So all of this came in this little tools box, which, you know, black cardboard, quite nice. White printing on black cardboard with a little bit of UV print there. Not bad. And it comes with a little card with some Velcro on it. There it is. Angle TKL. Wish you have a great typing journey with the angle. I did. And it says Black Simon on it, which is weird because I don't get to keep this. Uh, actually, we'll talk about uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about the good stuff now. So this keyboard was sent to me, well, basically for free. It was mailed to my house uh, for me specifically to review it. Uh, I do not get to keep it unless I want to pay for it. It has to go back to its original owner, that being Vertex, and. Uh, I'll discuss later in the video what my plans are for this board, but for me and the way that I do reviews is I get sent a board, I use it for a month, uh, I do a build or multiple builds in it. After the month is over, I'll decide, do I want to send it back? Do I want to pay for it? Do I want to throw it in the garbage? All right. So under this, there's a piece of foam. And under the piece of foam is where the PCB, the plate, as well as all the internal foams go. So this is the very bottom foam. Uh, so there were quite a few pieces of foam actually uh, that were given to us for this. Uh, one of which was mandatory, but I did not use it. Uh, we'll talk more about that once we get into the case internals, but uh, be warned that this, the Chinese version, uh, has a mandatory piece of foam and a whole bunch of other foam. Uh, the plate that I was given was a aluminum plate, fantastic. The PCB that I was given was pretty cool. And then going further into here, you get the keyboard itself, which is wrapped in this nice mi microfiber cloth. Obviously mine is fully built. Let's just pull it out. Ugh. There it is. And that's it. That's, that's the whole box. Now, my argument against nice unboxing experiences like this is I, if I wasn't going to be sending this back, or if I choose not to send this back, then I'm literally just going to throw this away. Because what am I going to do? It's either going to take up space in my closet forever in the hopes that like one day you can sell it to someone, or you throw it away because it's literally garbage. It's made out of cardboard and foam. I would have preferred a hard case personally, or at least the option for a hard case, because I understand that packaging like this gets expensive quickly. And I'm fairly certain for the price of this very nice, by the way, fantastic packaging, I could have gotten a very nice hard case. And I just love me a hard case. A hard case is actually useful. I can use it to store the keyboard easily without having to go through like 18 layers of foam. Uh, it takes up substantially less space than, you know, huge, you know, multi-section uh, packaging. Uh, as a result, it is a smaller uh, smaller box to ship, which saves on volumetric shipping. And most importantly, you don't have to throw away all this garbage and you actually get something that you can keep using for years on end. Because this, even if you just put it in your closet, eventually the humidity and silverfish and whatnot are just gonna degrade the cardboard. So why would you not give me a hard case? All right, let's put these tools in here. Here we are. All right. Uh, you guys that are very observant will notice that I am shooting this review wildly out of order. Uh, this is actually the first bit that I am shooting. I have shot the B-roll already, but I have not shot the intro yet because I am still waiting on some information to come from Vertex before actually making this video. All right, let's finish packing it up. There we go. I have to say, though, the, the box is very, very nice, even though it's black and I hate black and my fingers absolutely destroy anything that's black. But it is a fantastic box. It's probably the nicest box and the nicest unboxing experience that I have enjoyed thus far. Like, look at that, that's actually pretty nice. But again, this is all garbage, unfortunately. 
All right, uh, next we'll go into the case externals and see what's up. And here we are with the case externals. Now we can see that this is a standard TKL form factor. The spacing between the 60% cluster and the nav, as well as the 60% cluster and the F rows are standard proportions, so none of that weirdness. So in theory, a standard uh, 87A could fit in here on 87, well, maybe B, because it uses a daughter board. So first things first, you guys can see that there's a bit of a gap here on the left side of all the keys. Uh, this is due to how the mounting works and some executive decisions that I've made, but you guys can see that I can fix that and we will fix it once we open it up. So let's uh, do a quick tour around the outside. The version I have here is black anodized. You can tell because the second I touch it, it gets ruined forever and people keep sending me black keyboards. Why, why do you do this? Uh, the proportions here on the right are rather large. By that, I mean more than four millimeter. Uh, the top and bottom look around eight millimeter. Uh, the reason I'm saying around is I can't find my calipers, so I'm kind of eyeballing this one. All right, let's 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 just tour through the top real quick. We see that we have clean, rounded edges, nice, simple. The chamfers on the front are very tight. Let me show you. Look at that. That is a very, very tight chamfer right there. Very small. One of the smallest chamfers that I've seen be this clean, which is nice to see. And we've got ourselves this interesting thing here. Now, Vertex explained this to me, and it just completely eluded my mind. Uh, it's a moonstone of some sort. It's like sodium hydroxide chloride memes. So it's some sort of like crystal that they make apparently that goes into this keyboard. And this is essentially attached from the bottom side and held in by a piece of aluminum. It's pretty cool, look at that. So mine is blue and has a small little crack in it, which I don't personally mind, or a couple small cracks in it. Looks pretty cool to me. Let me show you that on the macro cam, okay? Let's see what this looks like. And you can't even see it. Let's try and get a little bit closer. Come on. Show me. All right. A little bit of auto ISO action. All right. There we go. I mean, with all the lighting, it's kind of hard to see. From here, you can see the texture, obviously. But from up top, you can see the color, which is quite a nice color, I'll be honest with you. Now, I was going to wear gloves while doing the case externals, but at this point, I've just completely given up because I also sweat through my gloves, and it doesn't help at all. All right, so to recap, wing keyless, standard spacing. We've got nice clean chamfers all the way around, nice rounded edges. We've got the little crystal here, which is neat. Uh, you've got the completely misaligned top, which we will fix. But aside from that, super clean. The uh, the top in terms of the anodization is fantastic. I know it doesn't look fantastic to you guys because I've been touching it for a month. I promise I made my best efforts to clean the hell out of it and that resulted in nothing. All right, going to the back, we can see that this right here is the top piece. This bit right here, that's the top. This is the bottom piece. So the top piece is perfectly flat in uh, such a way that the bottom makes the angle, right? So it is seamless by design. Here we've got a little, little engraving for their logo, which I like. I'm a fan of engravings. Camera. Camera. Just right there. Just focus right there. Do it. All right. As for the side profile, side profile is relatively simple. Again, bottom makes the angle, top stays flat, 
This is inset a tiny little bit. If we look at this, you can see that it comes out a tiny little bit. There's a tiny bit of curvature right there. Tiny little bit of curvature right here near the edge. So it's flat here and then it just slowly curves until it flattens. It's a nice touch, an expensive touch in terms of, uh, in terms of machining complexity, but I do like it. Let's see. The front, there isn't much going on for the front. Uh, again, I don't have my calipers, but the adjusted front height of this looks like 22, including the feet. Now, the weight of this keyboard is incredibly misleading and will mess with a lot of figures. So, for example, when I, uh, when I check the angle of this keyboard, right, using my inclinometer, uh, it sits between 8 and 9 degrees. Why does it sit so high? Because the majority of the weight on this keyboard is in the front. Therefore, the front sits lower than the back on a desk mat. So it basically gives it more angle. If you are on a hard surface, this would probably be eight degrees or slightly under. But the fact that you put this on a desk mat, the front will sit much lower because of all the weight than the back. So like the back is easy to lift up. I can just lift the back. The front is really hard to lift up. And this is a heavy board, fully built. Let's see how much it weighs. The fully built, it should be around 2,700. Yep, 2,782. So basically 2,800. This is with no foam. So with foam, it'd be maybe 80 to 100 grams heavier if you were to put in all of the optional foam as well as the required foam. This makes it the second heaviest keyboard I've ever handled. Uh, the first obviously being the Geonworks F1 with its sextuple internal brass weight. So this feels a lot, this actually it doesn't feel heavier than my Jane, but it is. So it's it's heavy in a super weird way. I, I guess because all the weight is uh, towards the front that kind of throws it off. In terms of like the center of gravity, the center of gravity is pretty much on the middle row, which is quite rare for a keyboard. Let me try and, yeah, there we go. So the center of gravity is about here, which is exactly halfway through the board. Uh, normally the center of gravity for most TKLs is a little bit on the back end. Uh, as, as for the center of gravity left, right, it's basically the same, like it should sit directly in the middle of the board. But you can tell that there is quite a lot of weight in the front of this board. Now that, ha that, uh, that affects the typing feel a little bit, uh, mostly through sound. Uh, it affects just handling the board and whatnot. We'll, we'll talk about feel and sound later, but you guys get the idea. All right, the back, again, I, cl I cleaned this and then it got uncleaned, but I tried. Uh, the back, well, I mean, you, you can see what's going on here. We've got a huge PVD, I'm assuming, I'm assuming brass. I'm assuming brass weight, steel would sound slightly higher pitch than the aluminum, but this sounds lower pitch, so brass. Yes, science, science, Simon. So we've got angle here machined into it, as well as a little triangle. I do appreciate the triangles. Uh, you guys can see, you know, some smearing in the PVD. This is fairly standard for keyboard grade PVD. On PVD DLC, it should be like a completely flat mirror-like surface, but the uh, the type of PVD that's done on boards is different. It's cheaper. If this was to be done in PVD DLC, this would probably cost like $4,000 just for the weight. But it is well done. The mirror finish is, is good. Look at that. You can see the Simon. That's that's what that's what we're looking for. If you can see the Simon, then it is shiny enough. So this takes up, like, this draws the eyes towards this particular bit of the keyboard. This is the back, basically. Now, uh, I had a lot of notes about this particular keyboard, and Vertex basically responded with, "Hey Simon, we're fixing that. Yep, we're fixing that. We're fixing that. We're fixing that." One of the things that Vertex did say he was fixing, which uh, up to the date of when I'm recording this bit of the video, we still don't have a word on. He said he will improve the acoustics. Now, the acoustics aren't bad, but they are non-standard. The fact that the uh, brass weight sits so forward in the case, instead of further back, 
kind of messes with the sound profile a little bit. And this is something you'll notice during the typing test. I won't give you uh, uh, an auditory example now, but the idea is normally when you're typing on a TKL, these two rows will sound deeper as well as the entire top of the keyboard due to how it assembles. And then the, uh, the, the lower rows will sound a little bit higher pitch. For this, it's the opposite. So these, these right here, these two rows, as well as the spacebar and whatnot, sound a lot deeper than they would on a standard TKL. Uh, it throws you off at the beginning because most every board's bar weight is higher up in the board. However, after using it for actually five weeks, I just, I became numb to it. The, the best kind of board that you can use is a board that, you know, after four or five weeks, you don't even realize. You don't realize if it's good or if it's bad. It just kind of melts away. It's kind of like, you know, driving a Mercedes. You don't realize how good it is until you have to, you know, drive a Hyundai or something. And I did notice that. I, I did get used to this and the sound was totally fine. So the, the placement of the internal weight is not something that I would be, uh, that I would push for to be changed. But if Vertex changes it, that's fine, I guess. All right, what else have we got going on? We've got the little feet here, and these are decently done feet. They're, they, uh, they sit about 0.5 millimeters into the case to get a nice grip in there. Uh, the material is just standard rubber. Uh, it does attract dust and, uh, I mean, small little particulates. When I was cleaning it, this whole thing was just, you know, covered in white speckles from my, uh, uh, from my paper towels. So I had to clean that off. But otherwise, fairly simple. We can see the case screws right here. I only have two in here. Don't ask why, the rest are over there on, on the side, but there are a total of 12 case screws and all they basically do is just grasp onto the top. The, the bottom of this board is where the meat is, it's where all the action is going. Uh, it's the bit that you assemble before you put the top on. The top is basically purely decorative when it comes to this. And these right here just hold the top to the bottom. I, I, I know that's a weird way of explaining it, but uh, for example, if you've got a seamed board where the top and bottom kind of come to meet together to make the keyboard, this works kind of differently where the bottom is the keyboard and then the top just sits on there. All right, uh, one last thing. Uh, I'll see if I can make you hear it. If not, I'll do it as part of the sound test. So I'll watch this part of the video and see if it comes off or not. But it does make a weird sound. Uh, let's see, boom, all right. What I'm talking about is the resonance, not the fact that I don't have screws in there, but the resonance sound is something that I've noticed while assembling it. Uh, the thinness of the top, because the top is incredibly thin, if you look at how little top there is. The thinness of the top just sounds kind of weird when you're handling it. it. It sounds cheap. I know it's not cheap, but it sounds cheap because it's thin. Generally, a top is a little bit thicker than this. This is like, what, 0.6 millimeters in, uh, in thickness right there. Or sorry, yeah, 0 0.6. 0 0.6. Shit, I'm actually not sure. Let's find out. I completely forgot how, how like, uh, measurements work. It is 2.2 .2 millimeters. Using this uh, M2.5 to get an idea. Okay, there we go. I was sure I had the wrong number. But my point is, it is thin. And it sounds. It sounds thin. Uh, there have been a couple of boards that there have been a couple boards where I have noticed this kind of sound thing. One of them was the Aru, which didn't contribute at all to its sound, but when handling it, you could kind of hear that it, the top didn't sound very sturdy. That's something here. I don't think it's a problem, but it is a thing. So keep in mind, when you're handling the top, you'll, you'll kind of hear it ping and echo as you like touch it just because it's so thin. Does that mean it's bad? Not necessarily because 
the point of the keyboard is to type on the keycaps and not slap the sides. All right, uh, let's see, what else have we got? We've got the USB port. Let's have a look at the USB port. So the connector itself, come on, camera. The, connect, the connector itself, why is it not focusing? The connector itself sits flush, like completely flush, which I love to see. And there's a nice big cutout to allow you to get your chunkier connectors in there. In terms of ease of getting the port in without having to look, as long as you finger around the hole, there we go, easy enough. So that is nine out, nine out of 10 USB port. Could be a 10 out of 10 if it was purely surface mount, but honestly, fantastic. The fact that I can just get it in and out without having to look, without having to fiddle, is good. All right, now finally, finishing quality, the quality of the finishing, the anodization itself is good again, Please do not pay attention to my terrible fingerprints, but I don't see any splashing. I don't see any large grain. I don't see any changes in texture. Those are the things that I'm looking for when I'm looking for bad anodization. Uh, it's very consistent. The size of the grains are uniform across the board. It is a good black anodization. I just wish that it was not black. Uh, I have yet to see the other colors, obviously in person or even in photos. So I am hoping that the other anodization colors are as good as this black anno. To be fair, this black anno is, is solid. It beats out the Jane CE for sure. Because the Jane CE uh, is kind of good, but it's not pure black. And there's some weird textures and stuff in there. So in terms of black anno, great. Uh, in terms of fingerprint magnet, not great because hands. All right, uh, is that it for the externals? I think that's it for the externals. We will uh, take a quick look at the screws before we look at the case internals. That is the reason why I have taken all of these screws out of the case already, just so we can have a nice look at them on the macro cam. Boom, all right. Now, those of you familiar with my screw reviews will understand that when I saw this, this uh, brown at the tip of the screw, I was very concerned because generally when you see gunk at the tip of a screw, that means that the threads were not, uh, were not cleaned properly during the manufacturing process. This, however, is not that. So this is basically glue right there and that can just be easily scraped off. The reason for that being there is actually really interesting and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it more when we look at the case internals, but basically inside of the thread, uh, they put a little bit of a glue type substance to make it so that the, uh, the anodization would not get in there and mess up the tolerances of the threads, which is pretty cool. So it's just something they put in there temporarily to prevent, uh, to prevent the screw tap itself from being messed up. Pretty cool. Uh, they did give us additional case screws, by the way. So like, if you do end up with a couple of these, you can just swap them out for ones that don't have the gunk on it, or you can just, you can just uh, get it off with your nail or whatnot. Uh, it was one of my notes. I don't think it's a major issue. I don't think Vertex is going to fix it because there's nothing to fix. It's something that's being done for a very good reason. And I understand why it's being done. Uh, and for the health of the screw threads, for uh, the finishing quality and all of that, it plays a large role. I hope that your units are cleaned a little bit more thoroughly than mine. But worst case scenario, you can get brand new screws from inside the box. So as for the screws themselves, we can see knurling here, which is completely useless for a keyboard, but I do like it. Uh, the finishing on the screws are quite good. I do like the finishing on these screws. Uh, the hex sockets are solid. I don't see any corrosion or uh, or rust, which is good to see. Uh, I don't see any plating coming off of the screw. If you guys see any shiny bits, that's probably just my hand sweat. But the quality of the screws are quite good. I would not give these a 10 out of 10 because they're not very shiny and gold plated and PVD, but the screws themselves, I would give them, you know, a solid eight out of 10 for screws. But this gunk right here, maybe, 
makes it lose a point, perhaps. It doesn't affect anything. It doesn't mean that the keyboard was not cleaned properly. It just means that there's glue on your screws. It's not actually glue glue. It's some sort of like putty they put in the hole. Anyway, that is the screw review and we will move on to the case internals. All right, I've got the two screws in here and you guys will understand what I mean by all the action is going on in the bottom because the second I remove this screw, the top is just gonna flop right off. Yep, there it goes. Fantastic. Whoop. Let's get the top off. There we go. And I guess we will start with the top. Let's see what's going on with the top. So first things first, we still have that kind of, you know, high pitch sound just because the top is so thin around the edges. And let's look at the internals. So we've got multiple layers of ledges here, which is interesting. We got quite a few layers of ledges. All right, where do we start? So these little cutouts here, where the top gets incredibly thin, this is where the actual mounts of the keyboard go. So this is where the plates mount. Uh, this is mounted via sandwich gasket pads. Uh, and gasket is a strong word here because they're just pieces of foam. All right, uh, we've got large edges for support and for screwing right there. So these are brought out to allow us to have a screw tab because this is so incredibly thin otherwise. We've got the little crystal area and I think we're gonna get the crystal out. I don't have my tools. However, they did give us a bag of tools. Let's see if the bag of tools works. That's the sound I want to hear. There we go. So in here was a M2 and an M2.5. Let's see if the M2 actually opens up this little area and we can, uh, we can finally check out that crystal. Oh, it does fit. Perfect. You love to see it. That's fantastic. So the tooling actually allows you to get at the smallest screws. There we go. Very, very small screw right there. Um, not worthy of a screw review. All right, how do we pull this out? Do we just physics? Yep, physics, there we go. And there it is. Oh. So it is just a small little piece of aluminum that holds this square. And I have been lied to. We have all been freaking bamboozled. It's a square, guys. It's not even, it's not even a triangle. Because the hole is a triangle. And from the front, you see that it's a triangle. But in reality, it's a square. What the hell? All right, let's take a look at this with the macro cam now. Yeah, there we go. So this is like the moonstone gem, whatever it is. And you guys can see the crack that goes through mine, which I think we can just reorient it so you, you don't see the crack. So problem solved. It's pretty cool. There's like multiple layers of like different colors. So blue is the primary color, but when you start looking from the sides, you start seeing a little bit of yellow, a little bit of green as well. See that right there at the edge, that yellow, a little bit of pink. A little bit of gold deep in there. That's pretty cool. Okay. So it's a square. All right, let's put it in in such a way where we will not see the crack. There we go. And then this just hugs it right there and aligns it. And then we can just screw it in. My God.
There we go. All right. So top doesn't have much else going on, but I do want to show you these screw tabs. So this specifically is why there was glue on the screw. So basically these holes, after being drilled, are filled with a compound to prevent any anodizing from going in there. And honestly, mission accomplished. What I had initially thought is they drilled these after anodizing, but apparently not. So these are uh, these screw taps are tapped before the anodizing process. They're just so incredibly clean because of that material they, that they put in there, which is fantastic. You do want that. That basically means there there can be any potential globs of uh, of uh, of acid or whatever that get stuck in there and start messing with the screw threads. Pretty cool. I mean, alternatively, you can just tap the screws after you anodize, but I'm pretty sure there's a reason they didn't do that. I am not big smart scientist like I claim to be sometimes. But the internal finishing here looks fantastic. It looks just as good as the external finishing. Not bad. Um, seeing some interesting things here for the first time. So you guys see how this is slightly inset? can get my little finger in there. That is interesting. So I assume this is part of the mechanism that they told me is uh, required for installation and I just didn't listen because I don't put foam in my builds. So there's small little, small little drilled out portions here, really hard to see, where essentially, I'll, I'll explain the mechanics to you in uh, in a moment, but basically the the plate and PCB assembly just float in the case until you squish them down. And even once you squish them down, they still have some motion, lateral motion and up and down motion, uh, up and down meaning forward and back, right? But these little guides here aim to keep your plate and PCB where they should belong. However, while doing this, you are essentially touching a piece of rubber that is touching your plate and PCB and that is rubbing along the sides. That leads to a weird sound and most importantly, a weird feeling. There's a reason why, uh, why plates, for example, do not have mounting points on the side. There is a reason why we don't let plates and PCBs rub inside the top case or the bottom case. We want that free movement so they can just go up and down ever so gracefully and beautifully as we type on them. So, I was told that there was a particular piece that was meant to go in there and they were like, Simon, it's mandatory, to which my response was, ha ha ha, no. And to be fair, multiple other builders that had originally built it with that piece and then tried it without said it was so much better. So I was right to think that, hey, a piece rubbing on the inside is a bad idea. And I was right. Now, so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Here is the bottom with the plate and PCB attached to it. Now check this out. I can just I can just move this. I can just move this. This is not the bottom moving, by the way, because the bottom weighs a ton. But look at that. I can just move this around in the case. Like look at that. I can I can warp it. I can make it go left. I can make it go right. I can make it go up. And I can make it go down. So there is quite a lot of movement here. There is quite a lot of movement and obviously I can make it bouncy. So the idea is there are corner pieces that are meant to sit here and essentially just made sure that it stays where it should be. Now, the way that I got around that was essentially just to put the top on without assembling anything and kind of just get it to where I wanted it and then close the case. Now, after closing the case, it can still move left and right if you try really, really hard. Like if you grab it by here, like as you're like taking it outside or something. But I kind of prefer it built this way, personally. So here we can see that we no longer have that huge, huge gap on the left. There's still a little bit of a gap on the left and we can fix that. So I can just pick it up, move it a tiny bit to the left. And for some reason, there's a bigger gap now. All right, let's try that again. There we go. There we go. No more huge gap on the left and it feels good. Feels a lot better now. All right, let us do 
let us do the uh, the bottom before we take a look at the PCB and the plate. All right. Oh, the bottom is really heavy. So I have got to be careful here because this uses a JST. And let's pop it out. Let's pop it out. There we go. And let us have a look at the bottom case. The fact that the PVD is as good on the inside as it is on the outside is fantastic. And you guys can see some light discoloration around the edges. That's like a faux, as in fake, uh, heat treated effect that can be done with PVD. So the edges are like more pink purple than the black of the rest of it, which looks really cool. Also, play the angles, know the angles, big angle engraving in there. Why? I don't know. But the the uh, the case internals is one of the places where, you know, I don't mind when creators go and put whatever they want in there. Because one, you're only going to see it when you're building it. And two, it allows people to make their mark. Uh, normally, this is where like collaborators and such will have their names on the inside of the board. But doing something like this, also pretty cool. Now, we'll talk about the mount points, then we'll disassemble the weight as well as the daughter board assembly. So you guys can see these very weirdly shaped raised areas right here. And yes, they are raised. Look at that. You see? It's interesting. It is quite interesting. So not only are they raised, but you can see that they come down a little bit right here in the center. I don't know what's going on with my focus today, but check that out. So this location here and this location here is where the plate makes contact. And this allows for the plate mounting assembly itself to flex a little bit, which is actually pretty cool. Uh, where is my, wait, where'd I put it? All right, over there. I shall demonstrate what I'm talking about to those of you that do not understand what I'm saying. All right, so check that out. So the plate meets the bottom case here and here. But if I were to press really hard, you guys see that this allows it to bend a little bit at that mounting point. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And that is, you know, it's for me, it's all about the little things when it comes to these uh, in-depth reviews, obviously. That's why I spend an hour on the board going through it and touring each individual thing. But this is something I have never, ever seen. And I think it's really cool. Uh, obviously, the fact that, you know, the, the plate PCB just floats here could have been done better for sure. But I do love the feel and I do love the sound that this keyboard makes. I mean, the sound, it kind of grew on me, but. All right, so we've got our plate mounting locations with holes here. These are uh, alignment pillars to allow the top to sit on the bottom without any movement. Like that. There's very, very little movement here. Like very minimal, like enough to make a sound, but that's it. Once it's screwed down, this top isn't going anywhere. And that's it. For the plate mounts, there are one, two, three, four on top and bottom, as well as uh, two on the sides. Now, you remember earlier why I said, uh, when I said that, hey, normally we do not mount plates to the side. There is an exception for that, and that is obviously for gasket mount because generally when we're mounting a plate on the top and the bottom, the idea is to get it to flex in the center and get a uniform flex across the board. If you were to also top mount this particular plate here and here, then only the very center of the board would be flexy and the edges would all feel harsh, right? However, with a gasket, a gasket does not create flex, a gasket creates bounce. So the idea is as I press down the entire assembly goes up and down. So I'm not aiming for more flex in the center. I'm aiming for a bouncy typing experience. So when I press here, the idea is like only in theory that the entire plate PCB assembly will go up and down at the same exact rate. Obviously you do get a little bit of flex, but that's not what a gasket is for. The plate is just flexing because the plate is going to flex. Plate's going to flex. All right. So Fantastic. Let's let's actually work out this weight. I have yet to remove the weight. So I don't know if this is a dual weight or a single weight. It looks like a dual weight to me, which means that this is its own discrete 
piece of brass, and then this is also its own discrete piece of brass. Actually, this might be steel. The internal one specifically. All right, let's see if we can actually get this open with the assembly they give us. Oh, yep, that does open. Yep. This is just fantastic, by the way. I know I've said it like 18 times, but giving me the hardware that is required to open up every part of your case is one of the nicest things you can do for any keyboard, realistically. Because normally what I like to see is a single type of screw head to essentially be used across the board because that makes assembly a lot easier. So I don't have to hunt for three different screwdrivers as I'm doing the plate and the daughter board and everything else, basically. And speaking of the daughter board, let's open this up so we can get a look. There we go. There we go. All right. The fact that this huge weight is just held on by M2 screws is kind of sus. I'm not going to lie. But we'll see if the external weight is also held in with uh, M2s. M2 screws, by the way, are the screws that you use to uh, to screw in uh, screw in stabilizers. That is the approximate size. But these are not as long, so these are even smaller, in obviously one of the axes. But the, uh, there are quite a few screws, and I never heard the weight move, so I assume it's also pressure fitted in there that there's some sort of uh, alignment mechanism besides the screws. Also, I believe these are magnetic, these tools. I'm not sure though. Let's, let's double check actually. Is this magnetic? Oh my God. Not only do they give you hardware, but it's actually magnetic. Oh my God. That is amazing. Okay. See, it's the little things. For, for any keyboard, it's the little things that make up the price. Because obviously you've got uh, what's the word? Your returns are not as good the more you spend. The, the, the phrase completely eludes me. But like, it's the little things that add to boards like this. Like if I see an expensive board, it needs to have the little things that make it expensive. All right, let's see if we can get this out cleanly. I don't even know how to do that. I'm just going to flip it over and yellow it. Oh, it is a single weight. Oh. I've been bamboozled. So this is just a single weight that just goes through, not a dual weight. That is very interesting. That is very interesting. Wow. So this is just a single piece. And there's some sort of assembly that holds these two deep, deep in there. And it looks like they do not give us the correct size hardware for this, but I will double check. All right, so this is just one thing. Interesting. All right, let's see if we can get these uh, these little boyos out. Oh, they do use the case size screws. Okay. So this is the second time I've been bamboozled while disassembling this. First, the triangle was a square. And now it's not a dual weight. It's just, come on, come on. I want to get these little guys off right here. Come on. There we go. That's cool. You know what that means? You guys know what this means? Oh, I think you know what this means. This means we can put it in backwards and nobody can stop us. Bam. Oh, it doesn't fit in the hole. Wait, we're going to make it fit in the hole. Eh. Okay, it doesn't. Well, that's unfortunate. It only fits in one way. But that is pretty cool. It means that technically you could machine your own as long as you, as long as you uh, put a screw tap on one side. All right, let's get these back together. 
at this point, I've just completely destroyed the weight with my fingertips, but thankfully PVD is a lot more forgiving than raw brass. The more that I hold this, the more I feel this is not brass, the more that I think that this is steel. The reason why I, don't, I have so little information about this is the international run is not out yet, and there's a whole bunch of changes between the international and the Chinese variants, which is what I have here. But everything tells me this is steel. But it could be brass. Who knows? All right. So that is the weight. Let's just slip it back in. There we go. All right. Okay. So it is a very, very, very tight fit. It is a very tight fit. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't personally use M2 screws for this. But again, I haven't had the weight move on me or anything like that, so I guess it's okay. I'm just going to put two screws in here just to hold it temporarily. There we go. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. All right, let's have a look at our daughter board right here. First of all, there's a little piece of, I'm going to assume aluminum, that goes over the daughter board, which is actually a relatively big brain strategy. You guys may not know this. But when you have a hole for a daughter board, that actually affects the acoustics of the board. So if this was uncapped and you were typing on, uh, for example, the number row or the F row, you would hear that the keys in this area would sound slightly different than the keys in every other area. So this is a way of actually making the entire, uh, the entire top row sound more homogenous, which is really cool. I've seen very few boards do this. Actually, this is the first board I've seen in person that has done this. And let's just pull it out. There we go. So it's got something here engraved in Chinese. It probably says, Simon, you're an asshole. But who knows? It's quite good. And following up with this same exact strategy here, we've got the daughter board. And the daughter board is essentially fully inset into a very tightly machined area, again, for acoustics. Pretty cool. Now the daughter board uses three screws here and this is a Vertex branded daughter board. Now my daughter board had an issue when I received it. The issue was that due to the, uh, due to the uh, surface uh, soldering of this particular USB port, uh, my USB cable only worked one way. That's not something you guys have to worry about because the entire daughter board is being changed, which is great. The second issue that I had with the daughter board is that this cable channel right here for the JST cable is very, very tight, which, hey, Simon, what does that mean? Well, it means that if I were to assemble the board, for example, right, and this happened to a few people as they were building it, and they didn't notice until, you know, after the build, but let's say this is plugged into here as I, as I put the plate and PCB on, it seems fine. Everything fits fine. But then as I start typing, I notice that this area around here feels like it doesn't have the same amount of movement as it should. Why is that? Because the cable didn't fit perfectly into the cable channel. And instead, the PCB was hitting this instead of flexing down to a lower point. So Vertex said that this cable channel would also be widened. Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. Either you can widen the cable channel or you can essentially get a thinner JST without this sleeving and both kind of have the same effect. Obviously, if you widen the cable channel too much, those of you that are paying attention, then it leads to issues with acoustics because now this area right here, so starting at the zero and ending with the backspace, is pretty much directly under the cable channel. So these will already sound different than the rest of the keys just from that small little cable channel, but if I were to widen said cable channel, then it would have a even more pronounced sound difference because essentially you've got more room for, uh, for a reverberation to echo in there and come back at you. And the more open a space is, the more it'll reverberate, the more it will echo. So Vertex has to play it just right. As of me shooting this part of the video, I still have not seen the international variant and what the improvements are. So the reason why this video is being shot so wildly out of order 
is because I'm I'm shooting all of the things that I can shoot now, but then I have to wait until I see all of the changes. Because Vertex basically all of my all of my comments, all of my notes for my review of hey, this could be improved, this could be improved, which is what a review should be, by the way. All of the responses were, Simon, we're already doing it. Yep, it's being done. Don't worry about it. So I want to see it with my eyes because if it is true, then this is a fantastic keyboard. And it's a fantastic maker if he can essentially fix every single issue all at once. And I do respect that. All right, enough talking about me. So daughterboard will be changed. Hopefully this will be changed. Realistically, the weight placement could be changed. I wouldn't recommend it because most of the people complaining about the weight placement, uh, either one, haven't typed on it or two, haven't typed on it for long enough because at the start, I noticed it. But it's not a bad thing sound-wise. It's just different, okay? All right, let us have a look at the plate and PCB. Uh, I'm gonna take all these caps off off screen and I'll catch you guys. Actually, no, we'll do it together. We'll do it together as I talk about the sound and typing feel of this board. There we go. We're gonna kill two birds with one stone and I don't have a keycap puller, do I? I do not, it's in my living room. Okay. We can use the finger technique, all right. So firstly, I build this with GAT Pros. GAT Pros are a nice, deep sounding linear switch that come factory looped. So they're pretty forgiving on pretty much any board you put them on, okay? So taking that into account, I'll tell you how I feel about the typing feel and the sound. So first things first, my feel, starting with my first build, and my only build was fantastic because I didn't put any of the foam. I didn't put the uh, the the required things that keep the, the plate from moving left and right. All I did was manually, you know, align the plate where I wanted it to be and then gotten it nice and nice and tight in there. And it is bouncy. It is bouncy. I'll I'll show you how much bounce there is on the macro cam just so you get an idea. Obviously, keep in mind, uh, the top isn't on here, and when the top is on here, the bounce will be reduced, but that's quite a bit of bounce, right? It is quite a bit of bounce because of uh, what the uh, gasket pads are made out of. But keep in mind, once it's fully assembled, right, you're going to have slightly less movement. But it is a decently bouncy typing feel. Is it as bouncy as the F1 with the, le uh, the leaf spring and the gasket? No. It is not, but it does feel good. So generally I type on a board for about four weeks before I put out a review. So I learn about the little nuances, the little, you know, the little annoyances, the little things I like. And generally as I type on a board, that's something I keep in mind over, uh, you know, over the four week period. And four weeks is pretty much the standard amount of time. So I typed on this board for five weeks. I basically forgot I was typing on it. So that was one of the most nice experiences I've had in a while was me stopping about thinking analytically and just starting to enjoy the board. It's kind of like when you buy like super like crazy headphones and you're sitting there trying to hear all the details. And when you get the perfect pair of headphones and you just start enjoying your music. That was kind of the feeling that I had. This thing kind of just melted into nothing. It was as if I was just using a good keyboard. I wasn't thinking about, oh, there's a particular thing here and I don't like that, or, oh, this is annoying, or I don't like the feel of this particular part or the sound of this particular part. So overall, I was very, very pleased with it. So the feel is bouncy. There's a little bit of flex. Okay, there's a little bit of flex. Obviously it's an aluminum plate. Obviously it's uh, sandwich gasket mounted. So it's not gonna be huge, huge flex like a polycarbonate half plate or something like that. But it was good. It was not fatiguing at any point. It was not painful to type on at any point because if you go too stiff, then you know bottoming out, especially if you type heavy like I do can be you know an infuriating experience. This however was nice, soft, just, it just disappeared. It just disappeared. And 
the sound was quite similar as well. So when I started typing on this, obviously I noted that the bottom sounded deeper than the top. And normally with a board, the top sounds deeper than the bottom. Is that bad? No, not at all. But for me, it bothered me for like, I don't know, the first day. After that, I was just like, okay, yep, this is fine. I, I only realized that I had gotten used to it after I switched back to using another keyboard. And I'm like, ah, this is what normal keyboards sound like. So the, the sound profile is interesting. I really like the, the depth that you get out of the space bar, first of all, because you've got the weight so, uh, so forward in the case. Oh, that space bar sounds so good. And you guys will enjoy the typing test, by the way. I've got my uh, new sound testing environment now that I'm using, which is a lot more accurate. It's very, very accurate. I've been told by multiple people that, yes, this is how it sounds in real life. So you guys will get an idea of the sound profile, but the sound profile is all about your preferences. For me, when it comes to sound, I love me an aluminum plate. I love me some simple switches and some uh, PBT. For me, simple. And uh, bonus points, if the PBT is beige, because beige sounds the best. Everyone knows this. But the sound profile is decent. With any board, you you may not notice it, but with any board, each individual row will have its own sound. And even though you think your, your board sounds uniform, it doesn't. No board sounds uniform because that's how boards are. So this just sounds not uniform in a different kind of way. It doesn't sound not uniform in a bad way, where, for example, on some boards around the daughter board area, for example, you can obviously hear that there's a hole in there or the cable channel thing where you can obviously hear a deep cable channel and it really messes with the acoustics. It sounded good. It sounded homogenous. The only thing is as you get lower in the board, the sound gets a little bit deeper, which for spacebar enthusiasts, which is all of us, by the way, uh, we are going to enjoy that. Uh, what I'm talking about is obviously the spacebar bias. And this is something I've covered quite a few times. And the spacebar bias tells us that if your spacebar is loud, it makes your entire board sound loud. And if your spacebar is rattly, it makes your entire keyboard sound rattly. And if it's high pitched, it makes the entire board sound high pitched. And if it's deep, then it makes the board sound thocky, right? Now, obviously I've built this without any foam and there is a bunch of foam that you can use. And if you wanna use the foam, go for it, but I enjoy decent keyboards, and this was a decent keyboard, especially without all the foam. And some of the people that have now built it with the foam have unbuilt it and built it again without the foam and are enjoying it a lot more. And here we are. Look at that. I managed to fill up the, the airspace. So, keyboard top looks very, sorry, plate top looks very simple. Our mounting points are far out from our connection points. This is by no means a leaf spring. Uh, a leaf spring, uh, well, needs to be a spring. So a bent piece of metal is not a spring. A bent piece of metal that goes around is a spring. Uh, that's my logic for identifying a leaf spring plate. So if I go from, from this mounting point to here, that is not a leaf spring. If I were to mount here, go to the end, turn and come back, that would be a leaf spring, okay? It's just semantics anyways. But the mounting points are offset from the attachment points to the plate. This means that you can actually get flex. You guys see that? This is not just bounce, but also flex because you can tell that as this gets here, you can see a little bit of flexing. You see that? I can hold it pretty much at a curve. And the same thing applies to all the mounting points. So it does have bounce and it has a little bit of flex here. But the most important flex is the plate wide flex where you press in the center and the center will flex down more than the top and bottom. Obviously, uh, when we type, that is the, uh, the typing experience, the flexi typing experience that most flex enjoyers enjoy. Now, the fact that we can get a decent amount of flex may have something to do with these flex cuts right here. But this is a standard thickness 1.5 millimeter plate and I assume 5052 aluminum. Kind of sounds like it. I know. Um, this is me with zero information trying to like figure out a board by tapping it. And thus far, it's been pretty good. All right. So we've got a decent amount of flex cuts. 
All right, we can see that this is a fixed NC plate, which for acoustics, again, is great because once you have the big N, uh, the big ISO hole here and you build it NC, you notice that the sound in this area is kind of weird. This leads to a nice, clean, simple sound, which I do enjoy. All right, so the plate is fairly standard. There's not much going on. There's some acoustic cuts here, acoustic cuts here, here, and here. Uh, these type of acoustic cuts, what they'll generally do is raise the pitch and make those particular areas a little bit louder. Although this completely depends on the board and what's sitting under them and all of that. But in general, in an apples to apples comparison, flex cut, uh, sorry, acoustic cuts like these will raise the pitch a tiny little bit. And sometimes you do want that for particular keys. All right, what else have we got? That's pretty much it. Let us look at, finally, the mounting material. Now, I showed you guys that this is bouncy, right? Press down, it bounces. That is incredibly bouncy. As a matter of fact, that is so bouncy that this is not a gasket. This is just a piece of foam. And I will demonstrate by showing you an example. All right, so I've got these right here. So these are the ones that are used uh, in the top and bottom. The sides use a thinner one. And I'm going to show you what this looks like versus an actual gasket gasket. If I can find one. All right, I found one. I just have gaskets on my floor. Yep, I'm a gangster. All right. So this is what's being used in the angle. It's literally just here. Let me. I, I'm just very gently touching this. This is me touching it hard. This is hard touching, okay? But this is me just very gently touching it. You see how it just instantly deforms? It's just foam. This is a gasket. This is me gently touching it. It's not moving. That's the desk mat moving. Here's me pressing it super hard. It barely bends. So this is a gasket. This is made out of rubber. And this is what the angle uses. It's literally just foam. It's literally just foam. which at the very beginning I thought was going to be, you know, kind of pointless, but it works pretty well. Uh, the, the, the mounting pressure is done in such a way that it still allows the plate to have some free movement, which is good, but it allows the plate to have so much free movement that essentially you are forced to add additional pieces of foam to kind of keep the plate in place, which I do not like, right? So while building this, I figured out that I had to manually attach all, uh, all of these. And there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 times 2. There are 40 different gasket pads I had to put on by hand. By hand. Uh, that's why some of them are crooked. It was uh, not a fun experience because I have very shaky, very sweaty hands. So I did not have a good time. So all throughout building this, I was like, oh, God, I'm going to hate this so much. It's going to be terrible. And after I built it, I was like, hey, this is pretty good. And yeah, it is pretty good. So plate is simple. Basically, uh, expanded mounting areas, little gasket pads, and those gasket pads land exactly in the area on the top and bottom. They just ooh, hold it so nicely. The amount of thought that has gone into this mounting is a lot more than you'd expect. Because, like, in, in theory, this seems like a really, really stupid idea. First of all, you know, using uh, foam instead of gasket. Secondly, using 40 different attachment points, having those attachment points be on essentially, uh, uh, like, ex ex extended pieces of aluminum, putting them onto raised pieces on the bottom that have a curve. And it sounds silly, but the, the more and more you explain it, the more it makes a lot more sense. And you're like, oh, okay, this mount has actually been thought about quite a lot. So most people will go gasket mount just to go gasket mount because they think, oh, gasket sells and gasket is monies, right? But in this particular case, this is a form, a form of gasket mount that has been done very, very well, where you can tell a lot of thought has gone into it, where you can see that the plate has bounce, which is Fantastic, that's the whole point. But also, the plate has flex, which is also very interesting. So, the mounting I really like. And as long as you are a 
skilled enough builder to not use the required alignment uh, foams, I would strongly recommend this simply for its typing feel. So as long as you have the patience to just put this exactly where you need it and then put the top on it and close it and make sure it doesn't move, you're good. Uh, if you have to use these uh, these you know side alignment things that you're gonna get in your international kit, then I would not strongly recommend this for typing feel because it's the equivalent of somebody holding these edges with their fingers. And as you press, you can feel it rubbing on their fingers, or in this case, you can feel it rubbing on the sides of the case. All right. Let us, yes, let us, let us look at the green. So this is a PCB. I know, everyone is shocked. Not only is this a PCB, this is the PCB. So we've got vertex and angle here with a little bit of silk screen, a little bit of copper, looks pretty cool. The astute of you may have noticed that there are shims for the stabilizers. This is a 1.2 millimeter PCB. Yes, this is a 1.2 millimeter PCB. And these shims help get your stabilizers to, I mean, you, you guys should know about shims, but if you don't know about shims, uh, I'll maybe explain it in some other video. But yes, this is a 1.2 millimeter PCB. That means it is a flexi PCB. Not only is it a flexi PCB, but it's got flex cuts right there and right there. So the flex cuts are around basically the home row area. And if we were to take a look at the plate, we would again see that those flex cuts are in the exact same place on the plate. That's good, that's what you're looking for. If you see a, uh, a flex cut differential where like the cut is here on the plate, but it's over there on the PCB, then you're not necessarily going to get the best benefit out of it. But having lined up flex cuts, it's fantastic. That means the places in which the plate is going to flex, the PCB is going to flex with you. Is it going to be a huge amount of flex? No, obviously not, but you're going to get a little bit of flex and that flex leads to a typing experience that isn't as fatiguing, that isn't as harsh on your fingertips where you can just go all day. And that was the thing with this board. I went all day and I didn't feel it for five weeks. I was just like, I was just going until I realized I was like, wait, I was supposed to review this a week ago. What am I still doing typing on it? All right, so PCB. This PCB is also fixed, by the way. This is fixed ANSI, which from a PCB perspective, fantastic. Wait, am I even pointing at the right thing? I am, yes, I am. I am pointing at the right thing. My, my, my thing is just backwards, there we go. But this is fixed ANSI, which is fine. It means none of the switches are gonna be crooked. Uh, I did not have an issue with the uh, the switch feet holes, not the switch pin holes, but the switch feet holes. Sometimes these can be a little bit too big. And then you get into the issue when you're trying to put the switch into the hole and the hole is too loose and it just flies out as you're trying to assemble it. It's a pain in the ass. This was not a pain in the ass. The build was very smooth. The PCB was very, very good to me. All right. We can see that it uses a JST to go into the daughter board, which is great. That means there's no actual USB connection here. We've got a physical reset switch on the bottom. I am a big fan of a physical reset switch on the bottom. Some people are like, oh, Simon, just use boot magic. No, there's no replacement for an actual reset switch because if you've completely fucked it up, you know you can always get it into bootloader. And I do appreciate that. Uh, we've got our controller here, which I'm assuming is a 32U4, but let's verify. Like the KGB said, trust but verify. Uh, okay, I literally can't even read this. Hello? Oh, yeah, there it is. AT Mega 32U4. It sure is. So that is a standard MCU that's basically being used in every PCB nowadays, unless it's a very small board or a very large board. Uh, also, the prices of these have gone up quite a lot. And as a result, prices of PCBs have gone up quite a lot. You know what else the price of has gone up quite a lot? Aluminum. So keyboards have become more expensive, not because people are cash grabbing. I mean, people are still cash grabbing. 
but because the prices of aluminum and the prices of uh, components for PCBs has gone up quite a bit. Not, not, not like 100%, but I mean, aluminum kind of has gone up 100%, but you get the idea. Prices are a bit more expensive. This PCB is good. Now this came with VIA support, okay? It didn't come with proper VIA VIA when I got it. Uh, for the international version, I'm hoping that it will actually have VIA support. What do I mean by this? I mean, when you put the USB port in, VIA recognizes it. So it needs to be a recognized, uh, a recognized PCB. Otherwise, you have to upload the JSON file and be like, this is the layout. And then it's like, okay, I got you, bro. But you have to do that every time you launch VIA. So it's VIA supported, but not like native VIA enabled. Like it's not on the repository. So hopefully by the time the international runs out, it will be on the repository. And you can just plug it in and be like, hey, VIA, let's go. All right. Uh, no LEDs, no nonsense, no weirdness on the PCB, by the way. Not even in-switch LEDs, which, you know, you love to see it. You love to see it. I mean, there are on the uh, on the uh, caps lock, and I assume the scroll lock. Yeah, the scroll lock. So the scroll lock and the caps lock have in-switch LED support if you want your indicators, but no LEDs anywhere else. No LEDs on the top, no LEDs on the bottom. Perfect. This is what I want. This is a board made for professionals. And by professionals, I mean like, like high tier custom keyboard enthusiasts. This is not a board made for, you know, I, I hate to say it, this is not a board made for normie thought chasers. Okay. This is actually a board with a lot of thought that went into it. And the simple evidence yet to be determined will be if the last part of this video is me confirming that all the things Vertex said were going to be improved have been improved. So, yeah, that is the PCB, that is the plate. And we talked about the typing experience, we talked about the sound experience. It's pretty darn good. Now I'll give you some final notes before we go into the typing test and then the summary that's probably gonna be shot like a week from now or two weeks from now or whenever I physically see the international uh, version. So, oof. I will list all of the things that I was promised would change, all the things that I would like changed that would be nicer in the future. And uh, yeah. So this is my pre-summary summary and also pre-typing test summary. So of as of today, it is December 11th. Uh, Vertex was supposed to get in the new international protos uh, this coming week. However, due to COVID and nonsense and problems and all of that, he is not getting it. So why does that matter, Simon? Why are you waiting for it? Well, the board that I have here is the Chinese version. And the Chinese version had some issues. Issue number one, I did not like the daughter board that was used and mine came with a problem. That problem being it only worked with the USB cable one way. So Vertex has promised that the daughter board will be changed to AI03's unified daughter board design. Additionally, the daughter board channel, so this, the JST channel, right, was a little bit too thin and either the cable needs to be thinner or the channel needs to be wider in order to allow less experienced builders to not mess it up, right? So when it's all put down together, the, the, uh, the PCB isn't slapping the bottom of the JST because it's misaligned. That was issue number two, okay? Uh, issue number three was all of the foam that was required to put it together. So previously, if I wanted that thing that helps keep the plate and PCB uh, aligned, it was an entire piece that went between the plate and the PCB through all the switches. So it was a uh, sub plate foam across the board. And I am not a foam enjoyer, I am not. With a board like this, especially a board like this at the price point that it's going to be at, filling it with foam is pointless. It's pointless. It's like putting stickers on your Ferrari. It's terrible. At this price point, you should enjoy the natural sound profile of the board. If you don't like this natural sound profile of the board, do not go out and buy 
well, we don't know what the price will be, but I know that the Chinese price for this was about five hundred dollars, and the international run might be five fifty, might be five eighty, might be even six hundred. And at six hundred, assuming all the changes are made, I'm kind of okay with it because the small attention to details are there. Okay, uh, the few final issues that I had with it was little gunk on the screws, which literally only annoys me and nobody else. It comes with extra screws, so that's not a problem. And hopefully they'll clean them out more thoroughly. It would be nice. Uh, the last thing, obviously, for me that I'm not a fan of is, you know, the huge, expensive series of boxes. I know that's probably not going to change. I would love to at least have the option for a hard case instead of giving me, you know, literally a kilo of boxes. At least give me a hard case so I can take this to the office and back because this is a heavy freaking keyboard. This is nearly 2,800 grams, so it's rough. All right, and then what else did we have for the changes? Uh, Vertex said he would improve the acoustics. That could literally mean anything. Uh, that could mean an additional uh, small little weight that goes up here. That could mean uh, making the weight down here smaller. Uh, it could mean moving the weight. It could mean changing materials. It could mean drilling holes into it. I don't know. I have yet to see it. He says he will make improvements. For me, that is not at all necessary, okay? I think the sound profile of this board is unique, but not bad. I have heard bad sounding boards. This is not a bad sounding board. Now keep in mind, this board was meant to be uh, put together with a whole bunch of foam. And I use no foam. And I actually like how it sounds. And I do like how it feels. So after this, I'm going to roll the typing test. After the typing test, I will be doing my final summary. I'll probably have a longer beard and 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 sadder eyes because it'll probably be like a month from today where I'm shooting this. At that point, if this board has the improvements that I expect, then I will give it a strong recommendation. I will. Just because of the fact that it's very rare when you reach out to a maker and you tell them, hey, this needs work, and they fix it. So a maker actually caring about a review because there is a review and there is a showcase. A review, uh, I mean, I, I don't have a keyboard plugged in, but a review is basically an, an assessment of something in order to make changes and like, you know, tell your criticisms about it. A review is meant to make things better, but a lot of makers will treat, you know, reviewers and reviews as just showcases like here, show the board. That's not what I'm interested in. And you guys know that, the people that watch me, you guys know I'm not, that's not my deal. But the fact that Vertex has just been on top of it is something I really, really like. So I'm gonna come back in the future. And if he kept all of his promises, I'm gonna give this a fantastic score. And if they didn't make the changes, then I'm gonna shit on it. So I'll see you guys in hopefully a couple weeks for me and hopefully like two minutes for you after the typing test. So enjoy the typing test.
Okay, summary time, let's go. So, future Simon here. It's January 15th. It's been a month and four days since I shot basically everything else except for the intro. And uh, the international version is delayed some more. Yay. Isn't that awesome? So, uh, I've decided to put out the video simply only for the Chinese version. And then once I get the international version, which will be like at the end of February, then, or hopefully at the end of February, then I'll do a review, like a much shorter review that builds on this review. So you'll probably want to have watched this review before watching that review. And if you've made it this far into the video, then you don't have a choice. You've already done it. So yeah. I'll give you my thoughts on the Chinese version. I'll give you the usual uh, usual tidbits that I give near the end. Uh, am I going to be purchasing a unit? I will be purchasing an international variant. Uh, it has been confirmed that the changes that I wanted have all been made. Though again, uh, I don't count my chickens before they hatch. So once I get the international version, I'll be like, okay. Uh, there's a very good chance that I might actually pay to keep this Chinese version because I kind of really like it. It's got a lot of quirks. It's got a lot of quirks. And the the issue with the mounting floating within the case sucks. But the fact that it's not mounted so hard actually makes it like one of the wildest, most bouncy keyboards. And uh, I had a couple friends over, and, uh, Paul and Alessio, who you may know, come over to my house. And both of them had the same response of, oh, my God, it bounces so much, Simon. What the fuck? I like that. I am an enjoyer of big bouncy boards and big flexi boards. Uh, the flex here is not ginormous, uh, but the bounce kind of is. So overall, as a keyboard, this particular unit at the Chinese price, 441 bucks. Yeah, because in terms of the material involved, in terms of the machining involved, in terms of the finishing involved, all of that, for 441 bucks, that's not bad. The only, the only point that hurts this keyboard, like in my brain and in the brain of a lot of like higher end keyboard enthusiasts will be like, well, Vertex isn't a big maker. I don't know who Vertex is. And yeah, that's basically the only thing that's not good about this keyboard is it's like, it's not a TGR. Like if, if I close my eyes and pretend and type on it, I'm like, Hey, this is a nice board, you know? And I explained earlier in the review, which you should really be watching the entire review and not skipping to the summary, by the way, because I talk about a lot of stuff that I just sprinkle along the video. But uh, I uh, I explained it akin to a very, very high-end pair of headphones or a very classy car where you don't realize how good it is. It's just, it doesn't pop at you, but through your usage of it, you're just like, damn, this is nice. And that's my take on on the angle. My take on the angle is, damn, this is nice. Uh, so I spent five weeks typing on this. Normally, I spend at least four weeks with a board because then if I absolutely hate it, at least the makers can't be like, oh, Simon, you didn't really try it out. You don't you, you don't get all the, you know, all of the nuances. But if I type on it for four weeks, they can't say anything, you know? So I typed on this for five weeks, and then I brought it home. And I've been typing on it since. Like, this has actually been sitting on my desk. And when I've got a keybinet full of like, here's a Jaguar, here's a KFE, there's a row of TGRs, there's a Cypher, there's an Aru, which I like very much. There's an i69, which like, I made this, I love this, it's so fucking good. Yet I'm typing on my angle, which has its problems, but I really, really like it. I guess that goes a long way in terms of explaining how good this is. It's not gonna wow you, uh, a lot of people may not like the design aesthetic. For me, the design aesthetic kind of grew on me because like in the end, what is the keyboard for, right? Because the aesthetics is just like the, the shiny bit at the front, but actually typing on the board long-term is what really matters. And typing on the board long-term is what I've been really enjoying about this board. So yeah, uh, if you can pick up a Chinese version of this board for some obscure reason, let's say the international version ends up terrible, which it could, we, we, we don't know until we get it. The Chinese version for 441 bucks, if you can get it for $441 in its original packaging, brand new, I would definitely recommend this board. I would definitely recommend this board if you enjoy a good keyboard. 
like sure in its you know in its standard form where it's got 87 million layers of foam it's kind of boring to you know enthusiasts like me because then it just doesn't sound like an aluminum keyboard anymore however if you build it without all the foam including the mandatory foam people enjoy it uh alex sotos rebuilt his unit without the 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 mandatory foam and he's like oh my god it's so much better I'm like yeah it is you know so the the foam implementation on this keyboard has been bad okay if you plan to buy it and fill it with foam don't do that buy a mr foam uh mr suit okay buy a mr suit keyboard because at least it's a lower price point, you know, it's okay. You're not gonna feel terrible about it. But if you want a nice keyboard that feels good and sounds like a keyboard, not like a rectangle filled with foam, then consider this. Or, or wait till my international variant review, which will hopefully come out in like March, if I get the keyboard on time, where I will sit down and be like, okay, this was changed, this was changed, this was changed, this was changed, 10 out of 10, done. Or we were promised this, we were promised this, we were promised this, and I am disappointed, and my day is ruined, okay? So it's going to be one of those two, because I just enjoy this so much. Anyway, that's that's the review. It's going to be super long. I uh, hope you watched all of it, and if you watched up until this point, and you're not subscribed, what are you doing with your life?